this is also one of the reasons I started to really get disillusioned with ads back in the day is what I also tended to find was if we spent the time and we have to do this, like most artists are pretty mid we're working with at best. I'm very lucky now. And I think all three of us are very lucky now that we work after all these years with much bigger artists. I'm lucky to work with some artists. I've been massive fans of for years. The point being, I would find that all of the other methods, if I concentrate on you, so let's say we had $2,000 to spend buying a feature, buying some sort of collaboration, things like that would get them to the people who are more forgiving of their midness because Every genre has a base of people that are very, 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 very forgiving because they just are addicted to that part of the genre. And that I tended to find got them to those people much better. And that's really why I started to make sure that like when I didn't have TikTok ads to turn to that I turned to that. And if they insisted on Facebook ads, then I would say, I really think you need to make a playlist with those artists that you would we would technically be buying future features or collaborations with and promote that playlist as an influence because that will at least get you to the most rabid fans possible of that genre that are gonna forgive that you're not very good yet. That's our most powerful strategy. Like yeah. that's the thing that moves the needle for us is the playlist, which artists still struggle with sometimes when we talk to them about it, because we'll put them as like the fourth song on the playlist and we'll put their catalog in there. But I'm like, the idea is that you want them to listen to the playlist, not just your song and your song needs to be live in there. But man, I, you know, I don't really like, I've done a lot of like feature oriented tracks before too. And I see it as a similar issue that you're communicating about the ads where, you know, if if I hear a track with a feature and it, I'm listening because of that feature, you're almost as disengaged as somebody would be if they clicked an ad. I would argue more disengaged. Really? I actually wanted to ask you about that, Jesse, because I made a note to talk about that in Bacon Spits tomorrow, because it seems to me buying the sort of features industrial complex is largely a scam in 2024. This is very funny to me because for me, I mean, I think it's the type of artist I work with that this is like the most solid gold thing you can do. But I think it's well, well okay. Well, there's a difference. Like, yeah, I think it's like I deal with a lot of hyper pop and weird electronic music. But also, it depends on a couple factors. Is I guess my caveat is because I see a lot of people go and pay a big artist in their genre a couple grand to come do a verse, right? And I feel like. A, because it's a largely unregulated space, a lot of times you'll get ripped off. Or you B, you pay way too much because you're so young and naive and you have a thousand monthlies and this guy has 200,000 monthlies and you think it'll, you know. And then I also just think that people don't realize like a true collaboration where I am friends with this person and so we have them on our song. That rules. That's awesome. But I think... A lot of times you see people pay a bunch of money for a feature and that guy doesn't let himself get tagged on Spotify, doesn't help you promote, or it's like not enough of a fit. And then also I think with the amount of money it costs, if the rest of your catalog or the rest of that song doesn't stand up to that feature, then like what the fuck? Because we all know artists who have really rich parents who spent hundreds of thousand dollars on features. There's one artist I know who got a major punk whose name everyone knows and probably the most important extreme metal singer alive today on his song. And that guy has, and like, that's cool. But like, if you don't have the stuff to follow up, like that guy probably paid six figures for those two features on his, like, you know, on his song. And all I'm saying is I see people spend like six figures on features sometimes. And it's like, I I have never seen that in my, seen anybody spend six figures on a feature. So, well, and it's less about like the cost versus like what you get from the artist and more about the type of listener. There's one act that we worked with and their pr- the producer on the act, he he knows everybody and he got some cool really relevant acts to feature on three or four songs and man, like he in within a year, you know, 400 500,000 monthly mm-hmm. listeners is going really well. But I don't think anybody could tell you, like, none of those people listening to the song could tell you who this guy was. And now I do think eventually, if you can be smart about it, you can take all those people and be like, you've been listening to this guy forever. It is sort of like this little trick 
that you can get things moving, but it doesn't mean anything to the bottom line. Like you're not selling tickets, you're not merchandising, you're not creating true fans. And even if I were to target all those people somehow, I think that they would be like, who is this? Like, why do I know this song? I'm sure there's a clever way to do it. It's better than starting from zero, but I know that he, they have spent so much money on that, that then it becomes that thing um, where is this really the best way? But I don't see, honestly though, in terms of quality, I kind of see it on a level with ads anyways. Like I, I don't, I see the type of listener generally being about the same. So it, it's pretty interesting because I do a lot of work. Yeah. Like in a certain genre where this is very common. And then my, who's at one of the biggest dance labels, like their entire, they literally started taking their budget used to be 70% content, 30% features and remixes. And they shifted that and swapped it. And they saw massive growth. They're one of the only dance labels that's good at breaking artists. But they make money from the music. They're not interested in building fans. Well, what's interesting is what they saw, though, overall was like a lot of this, too, was investments. Because a lot of the times there's these small artists are doing something with another pretty small artist. But they're all artists that are on their way up. And what they would see is just a return over many years of Mm. the artist page visibility of people going oh i love that song i love that voice and one of the other things i saw at atlantic i would say the number two way atlantic signs artists particularly singers is the chain smokers put you on a track and now everybody knows your voice and likes it and that's how we get bb rexa that's how we get all these different people because that is a real thing that having that discover weekly release radar head start and things like that is a real actual vessel for real growth at least where the corner of music i work in one quick thing a lot of what this channel depends on is memberships and what i do for my members is every week i discuss what's changing in music promotion the small tips the things i'm testing out and i dissect thoroughly for 20 to 40 minutes an episode the artists who are blowing up and finally getting a fan base to listen to their music and exactly what they're doing to do that so you get five hours of this content for five dollars a month I also answer all of your questions and listen to your music on monthly streams. So if you want to sign up, there's a link in the description or hit museformationlabs.com for more information on what I do. Okay, back to the video now. Well, and let me ask you, and and forgive me for not knowing, but yeah. is your relationship with the musician in a more of an A&R capacity? Like, are you having conversations about production, studio, songwriting, those sort of things? Uh, the funny thing for me is since my background was first producer and then marketer over the years uh, as that just shifted, I get talked to about everything. And, and yeah, in all reality, a lot of the time, I would say my biggest clients are calling me behind their managers back because they don't trust them about certain <laughs> subjects. Yeah. And they're asking me questions because they're like, this person's a great socializer, gets me in meetings, but they're a fucking jackass when it comes to thinking. I yeah. want to, like all my biggest, <laughs> like, you know, like I have this girl that's, who's got that's 16 every million manager ever, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, that, I mean, let's be let's be honest. I mean, we all work in this business. Most people are fucking idiots in it, and uh, but the artist will be cares a lot, and they want a second opinion. And a lot of time, yes, that is literally me sitting and going, I don't think this mixer is getting your song as good as this could be. You should try this person, this person, or it could be let's brainstorm the viral technique for your TikTok. That's I'll have two meetings back to back that are both the different things. Well, and I I love the idea of the features, and honestly, like I'm I'm not against it at all. I think where my brain doesn't think about that sort of stuff because so often we are handed finished products to a degree, and so yeah. we're at this point where there is no like it is what it is. But even artists that we work with for quite a long time, if I go to them and say, "Hey, for this next record, let's focus on some features," okay, who like we have to be ready. And willing to share contact information and you get to this point where it's non-scalable, where it's just like you're running in this agency and you're like, hey, you should do this. And if you say, I've learned this the hard way, if you make a recommendation, you better be ready to see that through because our clients, you know, it's funny because Matt, you said you work with 250 artists. And I, I don't know in what capacity, but we can't really break 50 artists because unless we double in size because we're so crazy hands-on. But that also means anytime we recommend something, we have to see it through. We have to be like, okay, well, you're in charge of it now. That's why sometimes I get on these calls and somebody on my team will be like, oh, I have an idea. And I'm like, you can't throw stuff at the wall. Like you just can't unless you're ready to see it through. 